Hier is ook deel van die, uh, dit is ons eeuwfeest, uh, dit is die 100 jaar uh, der denken, uh, en so dit is ons so uh, uh, part of the Stellen was 100 uh, lectures, or lectures for the seer. So, uh, our speaker today is, is Professor Garrett Walsall, who leads the Immunology Research Group at Stellenbosch University and a very interesting topic when the bacterium goes undercover, why not ask the host? And a uh, very relevant question, the direct protection of mycobacterium tuberculosis is notoriously difficult. It is very important to detect this bacterium because it's causal relationship to tuberculosis, one of the top 10 causes of death worldwide. Uh, many patients go undiagnosed and un uncured because of the detection methods that take either too long or too expensive. And the Visa Balsal's group gets around this problem by using a biomarker approach. So as you know, I'm a gastroenterologist and I don't have any conversation or speech where I do not mention that topic. Um, and we are tell people to also get their colonoscopy after the age of 50. But <laughs> regardless, um, uh, abdominal tuberculosis is a very common diagnosis in South Africa, but also notoriously difficult to diagnose. Um, so uh, in this, this sense, the Professor Walsall's group and the work that they do, the answers that they provide are, are very useful and very relevant. So, designing simple, affordable, laboratory-free tests, point-of-care type tests for use in resource-limited settings, and extensively published, uh, internationally renowned, um, and their studies point towards the importance of multidisciplinary, highly collaborative research programs. So, yeah, is a clinician scientist, trained in internal medicine and pulmonology, MBCHB from University of Pretoria and MED from Stellenbosch. I think we overlap for a very brief period in the, in the Department of Internal Medicine in the early 90s. And a PhD from the University of London. He was a research fellow at the National Heart and Lung Institute of the UK Imperial College London. Uh, since 2016, the director of the DST NRF Center for Excellence in Biomedical TB Research at Stellenbosch University, and also appointed in 2016 as a distinguished professor at Stellenbosch University. And this is a title we reserve for our very best academics who've reached the pinnacle of achievement in their university careers. Many recognitions from outside as well, and most recently, he received the South African Medical Research Council's gold medal for outstanding lifetime scientific contributions to, to health research. And as I just told him, something that really impressed me as well is that this is, he was very recently, his group is, is, is a PI on, a, on a, uh, one of the holy grails in, in, in research and a recognition, which is from the National Institute of Health, uh, which is a R01 research uh, grant. Um, and most importantly, I told him I saw that it was awarded in June 2018. So he's very much still on the go, and this is five year funding. So, as a wonderful photo from Kerala to Leicester, but when you're still doing it, it's in my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start off with the acknowledgement. So these are the people who do all the work. I just travel around and preach. Um, so the, a lot of the work I'm going to present, can you hear me at the back? Um, um, was done by Noel Chegu. Um, but essential support by Andre Lockston and Rita de Plessy are both in the audience, Liani and uh, Fani. Um, analysis by Gerard Tromp and Martin Kidd. And then um, the people in the engine room who manage the engine room um, without whom this work cannot be done. Now, these four guys were are all with the group for more than 10 years. And that is why this is possible. And no, they were not appointed as teenagers. And these are not old photos. <laughs> so tuberculosis, um, 
difficult to, to um, get the right pitch for this type of talk because the audience is very diverse. So forgive me if I tell you stuff that you have already forgotten. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is spread by aerosol. Inhalation are very small droplets. And uh, apparently you need between three and five organisms to get infected. And uh, the troubling thing is that these droplets can remain airborne for a long time. And if you walk past and inadvertently inhale one of these, you could be in all kinds of trouble. So the famous TV sufferers include King Tutankhamun, Voltaire, Eleanor Roosevelt, Nelson Mandela. He was actually admitted to Tigerberg Hospital with at your time, I think. Uh, Carlos Santana, who I really like, John Keats, mm. Emily Ronda, and then about half a million South Africans every single year. So the extent of the problem in the most recent WHO report on TV, 10 million new cases each year, of which 1 million are children. Two thirds of those occur in only eight countries, of which we are, of course, one. And the incidence across the world is wildly different. 10 per 100,000 in, in Europe, in, in the richer countries, and more than 500 per 100,000 in South Africa, Mozambique, and Philippines. And actually, in South Africa, it's almost 1% of our population that has active TB. 1%. That's crazy. 1.6 million deaths. <coughs> of which 300,000 are um, HIV co-infected. That means 4,000 a day. That is Novel Chegu. Thank you for coming, Novel. <laughs> 4,000 a day, that's like uh, 13 commercial <coughs> airliners going down each and every day. Um, drug resistance is the new dimension that could have really scary implications for us. Three and a half percent of new cases have drug resistance and 18% of previous cases. Um, that could really become extremely scary. Now, let me tell you about the pathogenesis of, of um, this infection. When you, for the first time, come into contact with the bacillus in the airway, the innate immune system may take care of it. So the innate immune system um, uh, has cells from the myeloid lineage, macrophages, for instance, dendritic cells. Let's focus on the macrophages. So these cells engulf the bacterium, they phagocytose it, and they may get rid of it. Now, the immune test that we use would be negative because innate cells do not get memory. They don't generate memory. Memory means that a second exposure, the response is quicker and more, um, more vigorous. So these macrophages do not have memory, although they may undergo something else, which is very interesting, which is trained immunity, where epigenetic changes to those cells may influence their responses um, for a long period. So, culture of the bacteria is obviously negative in this situation. As you smear, um, these people are not infectious, they have no symptoms, and they don't need treatment. If the innate immune system fails to contain infection, then those cells call in the adaptive immune system. That's lymphocytes. Lymphocytes like T cells and B cells. And these can generate memory. They activate the macrophage and they may be able to eradicate the bacteria. Now the immune tests are positive. The immune tests are either the tuberculin skin test, uh, in which you inject mycobacterial proteins into the skin and you measure the induration, the immune response, uh, within uh, 48 or 72 hours. Um, and the other test is the interferon gamma release assay set of tests which stimulates whole blood or PBMC but the nuclear cells with TB antigens and you measure different gamma production. So now these tests become positive. Culture is still negative, sputum smear microscopy is negative, no symptoms, no treatment really needed. Now in both these first scenarios the body is eliminated. When we fail to eliminate the body, we move on to a thing called latent tuberculosis, which is a very controversial term. 
Because in latent tuberculosis, we don't really know if it's really latent, if the bacterium has actually entered a dormant state, a metabolically inactive state, or whether there is just low-grade replication and the immune system plays catch-up, suppresses uncontrolled replication, but is unable to get rid of the bacteria. <coughs> Obviously, those immune tests are positive. Culture and smear are still negative. These people are not infectious. There are no symptoms. <coughs> and preventative treatment would help in this case. The problem is we don't have any way of differentiating between the acquired immune stage and the latent infection stage. We have no clue how to do that. And uh, stable latent infection may actually be protective. We know that from Norwegian uh, nursing studies where nurses who entered their profession with a positive tuberculosis skin test were less likely to progress to active TB when they were working with, with TB cases than those who entered their profession with a negative tuberculosis skin test. So most of the progression to active TB happens within the first year of exposure. And we, of course, don't always know when somebody is exposed, when do we give preventative treatment and when not. So in our country, about 75% of people are to work in skin test positive. So that's a problem because we can't treat 75% uh, of our population with uh, between three and, s and nine months of treatment. So we don't know. You'll hear, I don't know a lot of times, and I don't think it's only a reflection on me, it's a reflection on the field. We really don't know. At some stage, latent TB, which is remains latent in 90% of people, can progress to a subclinical and active TB state. We don't know why. We know that HIV can play a role when it depletes um, CD4 T cells. We know that interferon gamma, intact interferon gamma, and our 12 signaling pathways are essential. Uh, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha is an essential cytokine. Um, all these things are essential but not sufficient. So all those things can be okay, but you can still develop TB and we actually don't know why. Now, uh, in the subclinical TB, we, we clearly have, a, we also call that incipient TB. We have very few symptoms, if any. And the cultures and, and the microbiological tests are intermittently positive. Of course, the right thing here to do would be multi-drug um, uh, treatment. And uh, if this stage is allowed to carry on, we get um, overt active tuberculosis. Now, interestingly, we know from the pre-antibiotic era that people can progress from active TB, uh, regress from active TB, right back to infection elimination without antibiotics. That happens to probably a third of people. And in our large community studies, we often see people who never who were diagnosed with TB, who were never on treatment, but they clearly have the scars on the x-ray. They must have cured themselves. So there is the, these arrows are bidirectional. Now, the problem is not solved by treatment. Treatment may be sterilizing, eliminating the infection altogether. But most probably, in most cases, is not sterilizing. And people revert back to a latent stage of infection, or even a subclinical stage, which means that within the next couple of months after termination of treatment, I'll get TB again. We call that relapse. Even the guys who have eliminated infection um, through treatment are not immune to a second episode because they can get reinfected. So as you can see, this is rather complicated, and this has significant impacts on the way we deal with this epidemic. Now let's talk about how we deal with the epidemic. Dr. Sienegal and the philosopher from, I think, Pathke, right, um, are here, and they deal with this a lot. I don't think they do a lot of smear, uh, sputum smear microscopy. Do you? Yeah? So that's the oldest test we have. It's about 130 years old. We need 10,000 bacteria per milliliter to detect this. It's labor intensive because the technology has to sit there and look for these acid fast bacilli. It's not a great test, only 60% sensitive. Culture is the most sensitive test we have. It can detect 10 organisms per milliliter. 
But as you can see, it's not really the type of equipment you can load on the back of a bicycle and wheel off to a clinic. You need a lab, and the other major drawback here is that it can take six weeks before you have a final result. It takes six weeks before we say the test is negative, and it can take at least, it must take at least 10 days before it's positive. You are then faced with the problem of having to speciate. You have to show that it's actually MTB and not some contaminant growing in the sculpture. So it's complicated. Gene Expert is the new kid on the block. Uh, a very um, advantageous thing that came, came for, uh, to South Africa early. We have a massive roll rollout of Gene Expert um, instrument, the biggest in the world. And this is a, a PCR based assay. You see that little. Um, this little cartridge here, um, that is an enclosed PCR, a really fancy um, cartridge that moves the sample from chamber to chamber um, and does the PCR reaction. Within two hours you have a result for both the presence of MTB DNA and also the presence of drug resistance um, genes like, like for rifampicin. <laughs> So, this was originally developed for anthrax by the Americans in the, in the Gulf War. Um, that's, some people say that's the only good thing that came out of the Bush administration. Um, you can see from the setup here, it requires quite a bit of infrastructure. It requires um, stable electricity, it requires the cartridges. Uh, currently, they, they trade for about $10. Um, the, the test, and that's a subsidized um, price that will change uh, in a couple of years um, when that initial agreement runs out. So it's, it's great, but it's still not a one stop test because you can't place these instruments everywhere where it's needed. So samples have to go to a central place, to uh, Dr. Senegal's lab, and have to go back again. And in that process, we you know, as you'll see in a minute, we lose a lot of patients. Um, the other problem, of course, TV is not always in the lungs. Like uh, Professor De Villiers said, in the gut, sorry, I, didn't, I, I should have thought of this, to show a picture of the lungs TB. But here we have TB meningitis, TB of the spine, and even some forms of TB, like Miller tuberculosis, often gives a negative sputum culture because um, these, this hematogenous spread of these um, uh, bacteria um, actually ends up um, with granomas in the interstitium rather than in the, um, close to the alveoli or in the airways. Uh, children are also a problem. Other forms of porcine bacillary disease like HIV co infection are a problem. So we have a problem with diagnosing TB. And that is probably responsible for this rather um, disheartening TB care cascade that we see. Of all TB patients in South Africa, just under 600,000. We only cure in the end about 50%. Isn't that shocking? At each step of the way, we lose patients. Only we lose 14%, up to 14% before they even get tested, because the tests aren't available where people get it. We lose another 17% because although they are tested, nobody responds to Dr. Sinekal's results. Certainly in, in the peripheral areas that happens. Of those who are actually diagnosed, in treatment initiation doesn't happen in 13%. And of those who are in treatment, almost a third are not cured. So this is shocking. Half of our TB cases are not cured. And they are clearly, we need a lot better tools to do <coughs> this. So last week only, the UN General Assembly on uh, the high-level high meeting on TB took place. And uh, unfortunately, our president, um, President Ramaphosa, was the only one from the BRICS countries who all have very high TB incidences who, who personally attended this meeting. So South Africa has shown remarkable political commitment to making an impact on the TB epidemic. But this is what they decided. We need to find 40 million undiagnosed cases in the next four years. Can you imagine? 40 million cases have to be found. And the current tools are not helping. We need to increase the annual investment in TB care to $13 billion. And we need to up 
our research spent by 1.3 billion to close the funding gap. TB is responsible for 2% of these uh, dailies and 2% of deaths, but only receives a quarter of a percent of the global medical research spent. I'm not saying cancer and cardiovascular disease is not important, but TB certainly requires uh, much more um, investments. So, can biomarkers contribute? Long story to get to this. Can, uh, can biomarkers contribute? And we're looking at diagnostic markers, markers that tell us about prevention of active disease, either through vaccines or through targeted preventative treatment, and then also looking at treatment response. When is treatment enough? Um, who has a risk for poor, poor outcome? And uh, also the evaluation of new drugs and measurements in clinical trials. So what is a biomarker? Biomarker is any characteristic that is objectively measured and indicates a normal biological process, a pathogenic process, or response to intervention. Fever is a classical biomarker. We all use fever. Um, actually, sputum culture for TB is a biomarker. Because nobody really cares what's in the sputum. You want to know what's in the lab. So sputum is actually also a biomarker. So can we use biomarkers? Now let's start in the lab. So here we have a macrophage, a myeloid origin cell that has pattern recognition receptors that broadly differentiate between self and non-self, which is one of the main functions of the immune system. So these pattern recognition receptors will bind um, TB, internalize it, and this phagosome needs to fuse the lysosome to actually enable the macrophage to kill. When phagocytosis takes place, the macrophage releases those little dots, cytokines and chemokines. I'm not going to mention many cytokines because I have, through a bitter experience, um, seen the hypnotic effect that the mention of specific cytokines has. <laughs> In any case, these cytokines will attract other cells like, like lymphocytes, and uh, the macrophage, after degradation of the bacteria, will present some of the bacterial peptides on MHC molecules to T cells who then activate the macrophage to help it to deal with the ingested bacteria more effectively. That T cell will also release cytokines and these cytokines is what we are looking at for our biomarker work. Can the combination of those different cytokines tell us what is happening in the host? Of course, uh, eventually we end up with a granuloma, which is a, a walled-off collection of macrophages and, and lymphocytes um, where the immune system attempts to contain infection, to eradicate it, and actually the bacterium has developed fantastic escape mechanisms to actually live happily in that environment. So, how do we measure cytokines? Novell over there is an expert in this Luminex technology. So uh, Luminex looks at beads. You've seen the film 50 shades of grey. This is 100 shades of red. Very different. So, so the combination of two different colours gives you 100 different identities for the bead. That bead, every colour is then linked to an antibody against a specific cytokine. That cytokine in the sample is bound and you add in a fluorescent detection antibody that will give you the amount of, of, of target that is bound to that specific bead. Those beads are then in the flow cytometer, a special flow cytometer, um, run past in single file, past two lasers, and the detectors will tell you which bead ran past and how much cytokine was on it. And you can measure up to 100 cytokines in 25 microliters. So it's pretty um, powerful technology. So we looked at, in, in uh, two different EDCDP funded studies, that's a European Union um, setup that funds uh, research into um, poverty related diseases like TB. We looked at over 700 participants who had symptoms of TB. They came to clinics with a cough for two weeks, plus fever or night sweats or weight loss. And uh, we looked at those, and a third of them had active TB, and the other two thirds had other conditions like uh, bronchitis or acute exacerbation of 
of asthma or uh, uh, chronic bronchitis. And we looked here at 22 promising markets, and often well had screened more than 70, is that right? 70 um, in total. And you can see here, the, um, each dot represents a, a participant, and you see that the medians are quite different for these three analyzes that are shown, but the overlap is impossible, right? You can't use this, any one of these, as a single test to diagnose TB. At the bottom you see the ROC curves, and you know that a perfect um, area under the curve would look like that, 100% sensitivity and specificity, that seldom happens, uh, that's a bad test, so our tests are for individual cytokines are somewhere between good and bad. Now, let's talk about expression of cytokines in health and disease. Now this would be a fantastic test. You have cut off and it's you have a very um, small false positive and small uh, uh, false negative rate. Alas, that never happens. It looks like this. Now your cutoff is pretty useless because wherever you move it, you are going to you are going to lose um, either sensitivity or specificity. So the cutoff, and that's where a single marker would, would work, is going to be less valuable than what we have in mind. So here we look at likelihood ratios. We, on the x-axis you see the test result, and on the y-axis you see the frequency of the um, test result in different populations, unaffected and affected. So what you do with the likelihood ratios is you divide the frequency of observations in the affected by the frequency in the unaffected, and you have an adjusted um, risk for in this case, for, for the value of 1, in this um, example, the likelihood ratio for this person to be affected is 0.5. Now, the nice thing about this is that you can do that, and, and here you see an example for somebody who is probably affected with a likelihood ratio of 6. The nice thing is you can do this for multiple markets. And uh, although the exact algorithms will differ, um, it works more or less like this. There's an a priori risk. Um, in that group, it was actually 0.3. Um, and you can multiply that with different likelihood ratios of your different markers and come up with an adjusted risk. So, we are not the first to do this. Um, this is one advantage of being uh, married to a gynecologist. Um, they were doing this for a long time. This guy, Kipros Nikolaidis, in, uh, at King's College in London, he um, collected data on over 100,000 people, pregnant women. And uh, if you look at the, these five tests that are currently being used, and I'm sure several of you have undergone these tests for, for your um, unborn babies, this is to <coughs> diagnose or to predict um, trisomy 21 Down syndrome. You see that those markers actually don't separate very well individually. They actually look worse than the markers we see for TB. But nevertheless, if they use those five different um, individual variables, they get a 95% discovery rate with only a 2% false positive discovery rate. So this is what we did in our TB model as well. And we came up with a seven marker model, apolipoprotein A1, complement factor A, C-reactive protein, interferon gamma, IP10, serum amyloid protein A, transthyretin. Most of these are acute phase proteins, although there are two cytokines in there as well. Um, and together, they give a sensitivity of 94% with a 73% specificity. The important thing here is the negative predicted value is 96%. This is a triage test. This it has all the bells and whistles needed for a triage test. Not good enough to start somebody on treatment because um, almost 30% will be false positive. But it will pick up the vast number of people who actually should be investigated further. So we have calculated that we can reduce the gene experience by 75% if we employ this test properly in the communities. Now, of course, Luminex is not going to be a great test um, in uh, the village. Even 10 kilometers from where I live, 
where we work, if you sunk a crop, there's no, you know, they, they're never going to have a Luminex instrument or, you know, and, and people, they struggle to get diagnosed. So, so we need something that's portable. <coughs> And that's why we're working with these guys in Leiden University, Paul Costions, are experts on upconverting phosphor technology and we're making lateral flow strips that can incorporate multiple markers. Antibodies against those targets are on this flow strip and we have uh, at the moment still a, a desktop instrument that reads these markers, but in future it will be possible to have a handheld battery operated instrument. So this is how it works. Um, so we see here, uh, we've optimized it now in our latest project for finger prick blood. We collect finger prick blood, put it in a buffer, put it in the tray, and these, these different lines here represent the flow control and actually the, uh, the capture antibodies. So you don't have to lyse the blood, it flows within 30 minutes <coughs> over the strip and you shove it into this machine and you read these peaks and the instrument can calculate your risk to actually have active tuberculosis. So we realize this is an early prototype, right? We can't work with an open system like that with infectious risk, etc. But obviously the next step, once we confirm, should we confirm, I'm a scientist, not a salesman, should we confirm that this works, we will obviously convert this to a closed system. So, how close are we to a biomarker-driven diagnostic test? I think we're getting there. It's taken 10 years. But we are looking at a lab-free triage test on finger prick blood in a portable instrument. This is now being tested in five African countries and next week on Thursday we're going to submit our next grant to take this to the next level. Now, can we predict the progression to active TB? This study was funded by the Gates Foundation, it took 13 years. I think um, my colleagues all started as PhD students when the study um, was launched. We looked at 4,500 household contacts of TB cases across Africa. The study was initially led by Stefan Kaufmann. We followed those people up for two years and across Africa 80 incident cases developed, 3% more or less of the household contacts developed active TB. We took multiple samples at various time points of patching tubes um, at baseline and um, subsequently until those people developed TB or did not develop TB. So can we predict <coughs> progression? Those of you who don't know RNA-seq, we did RNA-seq on whole blood and patching tubes. So from the chromosome you have uh, this, this genes with exons and introns and uh, that is spliced and you end up with mRNA. So this technology starts with mRNA that's fragmented into these random hexamers and you get reads for each and every one of specifically spliced junctions. Bioinformatics comes and you put that all together again and you get a readout of all the mRNA that is present in that blood sample. Now, there are many ways of analyzing um, that and, and creating models, but our bioinformatics partners decided to use, or eventually after looking at multiple options, look at pairwise gene analysis. So each dot there represents a, a participant, red means they are a progressor, black means they are not a progressor, and for each gene pair, but with support vector machine analysis, uh, optimal differentiating line is um, calculated. So if somebody is above the line, it's a progressor. Below the line, it's not a progressor. Then, like with our protein work, single markers don't do it. So we build models. Here they built a model with, uh, I think, 42 genes. Each dot down there, each dot down there is a gene, and the line represents the pair. If the right line is red on this graph, it means progress. It votes progressor. That pair votes progressor, and if it is green, it votes uh, non-progressor. You see that this guy is, is a, oops, this guy is a progressor, but it has some green votes in it. You look at the simple arithmetic, look at the majority of votes, and you can you can play with that um, depending on whether you want to. 
test for diagnosis or for, for uh, prediction of progression. Um, and in this case, we looked at, I think, 75% of the votes had to be voting um, in, in one way to make it a progressive. So, how did we do? Well, the first initially disappointing thing was we used a training and a test set approach. So, you, you train your model on two thirds of the sample, you test it on one third. So, we built the model on South African samples and in blue here, and then we applied it to West African Gambian samples. Didn't work. So the closer this line is to this diagonal, the worse it is. So it was not statistically significant. So our model didn't work. If we built the model on the Gambian West African samples and applied it to our samples, it did work. But the bottom line is there's geographical variation. Then we build the model with a training set, a discovery set, that contains samples from different sites, from South Africa, from West Africa, Ethiopia. Then suddenly that model did validate on all the individual sites and on the combined sites as well. For this type of study, you need external validation. So we went to another study that UCT did, um, the Lesson Cohort study, where they looked at 6,500 adolescents in Worcester and our signature did show statistically significant ability to predict progression there. When we looked at the signature and the development of the signature, as people get closer to, to diagnosis with TB, you know, that signature, the current of risk goes up. We then took that same signature and looked at one of our cohorts on treatment. And indeed, the signature is highly expressed at baseline and comes down um, as treatment is complete. So that's another form of validation that the signature actually seems to work in telling us when people are developing disease or are getting rid of disease. We then looked at other signatures if they validate on our samples. And um, if you look at all our samples together, we looked at three other diagnostic signatures that others have published. And if you look at all our samples together, it works. But if you uh, um, separate our samples by geographical site, you see that a whole lot of those signatures do not validate on all cohorts. So the bottom line here is, if you want to build a signature that doesn't only work in Stellenbosch, you need to get samples from the different places that are going to be benefiting from the study. Which means that these studies have to be very large, and unfortunately very expensive. So this study has led to, um, I think, a groundbreaking study that, is, uh, that we are also part of, the Cortis study. We're looking at, uh, it's led by SATVI, funded by the Gates Foundation. SATVI is a South African TB vaccine initiative from UCT, with whom we have a close working relationship um, with um, people in, um, in Durban, Caprisa, and Gavin Churchyard in, in the mines. And uh, Booster, Satfi, and we at Stellenbosch are looking at 1,700, uh, 17,000 um, community people. And we're doing the, this, this current of risk test by, by PCR. And those who are positive, about 15%, we then randomize into either um, preventative treatment or just observation and follow up. That study is ongoing. And, um, that may be one way in which biomarkers in the future can tell us, in, for instance, a household contact scenario, this guy needs um, preventative treatment for the next 12 weeks or don't bother. Lastly, treatment response. We know there are different types of bacterial populations in somebody with active TB. And here we are depicting treatment. This is this, this uh, Dennis Mitchison died a few months ago. He was in his 90s and he was one of the um, fundamental contributors to the current so-called short course um, treatment of six months. He did the um, British Medical um, Council studies in, in uh, Vietnam and, and India. Um, and he came up with this 
there is a population of rapidly growing bacteria that kill very quickly. Within a week, they're gone. It, then there's another population that takes about two months to disappear. And then there are populations that really exist below our detection limit. So after two months, we don't know if somebody has viable bacteria or not. We can't measure that. And that's a problem. We're flying blind. So when you stop, the current six-month treatment regime was a pragmatic decision. If you shorten it, you get relapse. So you shorten it, you get relapse, bacteria come back. If you lengthen it, everybody's upset because it's expensive and takes too long. So they chose six months, and we have a pretty reasonable um, cure rate of six months. Uh, but really, in the last four months of treatment, we have no clue what's going on because the guy doesn't have symptoms anymore um, and they have no bacteria that we can measure. And there is a huge push to shortening the treatment from six months to currently four months on, on the same drugs and eventually two months and hopefully even shorter as new drugs come online. But to get there, we need to know what's happening in this Phase where we are flying blind. So we did a study um, where we employed PET-CT imaging, that's um, positron emission tomography coupled with computerized tomography, or CT. Now, we use a radioactive glucose as a tracer molecule. That tells us about inflammation. It doesn't tell us about TB. It tells us about inflammation. And here you see a, a picture, a typical picture of person with bilateral upper lobe disease, that's the heart, um, and this just tells us there's glucose being utilized in these upper lobes, but we use that as an indication of lung inflammation during T. So the two modalities, treatment and uh, imaging modalities are firstly CT, which is a structural um, readout. It basically look, looks at each voxel, each dot of three, uh, 3D 0.05 cubic millimeter um, the area and looks at density. Is it as dense as bone, as dense as water, as dense as air? That's it. But you get this composite picture which gives you very good structural information. We use it in medicine all the time for brain uh, and for lung, uh, lung cancer staging. Here we combine it with a functional component called a PET, um, which tells us, if you combine the two pictures, you know, okay, this is the structure, this is where it happens, and there's increased activity there. So, can we use that to get a better idea of what's happening in treatment? So, here you see three different response patterns uh, during treatment in people that are cured. To our big surprise, only 14% of people have this response in the, from these six uh, panels. So, <coughs> massive inflammation comes down and there is no increased PET signal at the end of treatment. Uh, although there are structural changes, there's scarring, there may be some small holes left, but this person has no increased glucose activity in his lung and hasn't, doesn't have any inflammation. How? That only happens in 14%. In the majority, 62%, although it's a lot better than at the beginning, at the end of curative treatment, they still have lots of lesions. If you show this picture to a radiologist, he or she will say, active TB. And even more surprising was that at the end of treatment, about a quarter of our patients had new lesions. Now you can explain this stuff away by saying, okay, it's slow bleeding, it's secondary infection, how do you get new lesions at the end of TB treatment? And these lesions look very much like active TB. So we looked at the sputum mycobacterial mRNA. Now mRNA is notoriously short-lived because of RNAs. And in a third of our patients, cured patients, we saw high levels of mycobacterial RNA in the sputum. Now that coupled with the imaging 
suggests that these bacteria are still alive. We did bronchoscopy on a handful, I think 15 patients. All of our bronchoscopy patients showed positive mRNA at the end of treatment. Now together this suggests that bugs are gone. So we are back in a latent or subclinical form of infection and your immune system needs to take care of the rest. And does that explain why people with diabetes and with HIV infection have very, very high relapse rates? 15% relapse rates? Because the immune system cannot even cope with that reduced level of um, bacteria. So we know that 85% uh, of people on short course, like four months treatment, are actually cured. The problem is we don't know which 85%. So we are applying this PET-CT um, data set now to treatment shortening criteria. So we're doing this uh, EDCP and Gates Foundation funded phase 2B non-inferiority trial, clinical trial. So a patient gets um, enrolled, we do PET-CT, the PET-CT shows a lot of um, extensive disease, conventional arm. If the PET-CT shows potential for a treatment shortening arm because the extent of disease is less, the person comes into this arm and after four weeks we do another scan and if the improvement um, is not within um, the expected limits, the patient goes back to the conventional six month arm. But if the patient stays in the shortening arm after four, week, four months, we randomize them into a six month conventional arm or an early completion arm um, of, of four months. Now, this is a proof of concept that we never go to use PET-CT to manage patients in, in South Africa, TB patients, it's just ludicrous. We're using it as a proof of concept study that the extent of disease at baseline and the early response to treatment can tell us whether somebody is at high risk for poor outcome or not. And secondly, we want to discover biomarkers that can do away with PET-CT. And uh, we've been focusing on, on this comparison a lot and looking at gene expression and looking at protein markers to um, try and find markers that can tell us either early on, before treatment starts, or early on, whether somebody's at high risk or not. So, in summary, biomarker driven intervention appear promising, but we are not salesmen, so we acknowledge that these are baby steps. We are targeting several cut points. We're looking at diagnosis, we're looking at prevention of active disease, we're looking at treatment response. And we, we find, somewhat to my surprise, that these biomarkers from these different stages are pretty complementary. The biomarker discovery process is as long, if not longer, than drug discovery processes. So we start off with mostly unbiased, these omics approaches like RNA-seq. Um, you can use genomics, transcriptomics, epigenetics, proteomics, metabolomics. These are the unbiased approaches and they will tell you differentiating markers, right? So differentiating marker then has to be developed further. We look at biological context, concordance in different studies, and then we come up with hypothesis-driven approaches where we design studies to specifically go and test these biomarkers. Then you end up with a candidate biomarker, I think that's where we are now, where we have to do large expensive studies and look at different geographies, different severities of disease, to rule out false positives and false negatives, and then to develop tests, and that's where we try to work with Willy Perrot and with Martin, um, to develop new tests to apply this where it is needed most. So, this is the type of consortium that we work with over many years. These people become your friends. Um, you see them all in your families. Um, and they are wonderful collaborators. And we have many different ones. This is the GC6 one. Um, we've been going for 13 years. And uh, it's, it's a really nice ride. Um, always the funders. I sometimes get this wrong today, but I right. always have to show the funder that's in the audience first. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remember to 
travel those at the next talk. Um, but the, the people we have to really highlight are the participants who um, do this with very little, if any, benefit to themselves, who are willing to vaccinate their children with an experimental vaccine, who are willing to take an experimental drug to undergo shorter treatment periods because we need to push the field forward. Those are the real heroes of this. And we also have to mention the government, without um, whose support we can't even stop. Thank you for listening.